Welcome back, everyone. As you can see, uh, Rubain has been replaced by our resident Bozo doll. But um, we have a special guest on today, Jake Razimovich. I'm glad to be here. He's the station manager for 91.7 VMFM, which is the, the, the station that we are under currently. Yes, and I guess I'm technically the uh, the overseer of this podcast. Um, I'm a very benevolent overlord. I, uh, I don't extend too far, but, you know, my name should be somewhere in the credits, I guess. Yeah, lots of people. According there, to yeah. the Marywood, uh, you know. <laughs> The faculties, at least. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about your job as a station manager, because I even like as a DJ myself, I'm not ex- quite sure about what your roles are. So the station manager really keeps the station running day to day. Kind of, I guess, once you get the station off and, you know, I guess running, the real job of it is working with the students and um, diagnosing any sort of issues. Um, a lot of things that come up during the semester kind of students missing shifts, um, people needing, coming to meet because they need to fulfill practicum hours, um, and, you know, other, you know, snags and snafus that come up during a semester. Um, That's kind of your main role. Uh, The other side of it is kind of the program directing part, and that is really making the schedule, making sure that the content that is going on the air is what we want going on the air. Um, then another big thing of that is um, directing student-run content. Um, it wasn't so much this semester, but last semester I had a lot of students who had interest in running their own kind of formatted radio shows where they got to do their own thing over the air. And then we have something like this this semester where you guys have a slot in the uh, the radio programming where we have a podcast on the air. And that's kind of the other the big role of the station manager is to oversee all that. So how do you monitor everything? Because I know that VMFM has very strict standards on what you can and can't play and can and can't say. So how, how do you monitor all of that? So in terms of can and can't say, you can't really. I'm not tuned in at every second of the day. Um, it really comes from the training process. Um, I usually oversee the training of most DJs. And in that, you need to explain what exactly you can say legally, what exactly you can say be in terms of your Marywood standards. Um, and then the other half of it is what exactly would you do we want to go on the air? And that's the music we want to hear. So the way we control that is we have a formatted library of music that is broken up into categories that are kind of based off decades. And then the log itself is laid out minute by minute of what you should play in terms of those categories. So a, a shift could start with a, a current song, and then you're going to go into a song from maybe the 90s, then another current song, and then a song from the 2000s. And um, this was kind of meticulously kind of formatted in order to hit our target audience. And I guess that's really the goal of the station manager is to make sure that what is being said and done in the station is reflected in resonates with our target target audience, which would be that alternative music fan, um, whether it's the the college age, which, you know, a lot of people could relate to, obviously hearing it from other college students. But it's also um, kind of the mature alternative fan, um, because we have such a breadth of different genres and decades. It's also good, I think, to switch it up to you don't want the same same artist being played a ton of times in a row or the same genre. Er, same same category. Absolutely. Saying. And I think that's the beauty of the student run shift every, you know, two to three hours is there's always somebody different in the booth. You know, it's not the same DJ all day, uh, you know, and each student has their own particular taste and liking. And as they kind of learn our catalog, they tailor their shifts to it. I think learning the catalog was one of the hardest parts for me because I never listened to too much alternative music before I mm-hmm. came here. So I would listen to songs and I'd be like, I have no idea what this is. Or I'd, I'd transition from a song I knew into a new song. And I would start, I would just like metal clang and stuff. Yeah, and I'm like, I did not like, mean to like go from like this to this. Yeah. But as you learn more and you, you find your taste, I think it's very interesting. And like, I learned a lot of new songs I would never have listened to before if I, I wasn't a DJ there. That's how I feel. That's how I got started. I started as a DJ as well. And it, that's where I've kind of found I was having the most fun was discovering new music because we have currently like 15,000 songs in our library. And like you, and there's no shot you're going to listen to them all. So it's kind of, and there's no shot you know them all. So it's kind of a crapshoot sometimes. You kind of guess by a title or an artist that this song might be good. And, so, and there's, there's so many times where like I'm like scrolling through and I have like five seconds left to add a song. So I'll just like yeah, pick a random one and throw it in. I'm like, okay, this isn't so bad actually. I kind of yeah. like this. And sometimes you get lucky. Absolutely. Yeah. Even sometimes with my not as much. knowledge, I still don't know all of the songs on that. Yeah, especially because oh. you're a savant with that kind of thing. And yeah. I don't know if you could know that many songs. No, that right. would be oof, a little too big-brained. I know a lot, but that's still more than I do. Yeah. 
So I heard that you had to take over in the middle of last semester. Is that true? I did. Yes. So how we're not going to talk necessarily about why or whatnot, but that transition. So what were you before you station manager? I was the program director. Okay. So then how did the head of taking on the station manager? How did that roll? So um, obviously the previous regime moved on for a reason. Um, even as soon as I started that role, I found myself doing a majority of the station manager work anyway, kind of being that point of contact for students and actually getting the ball rolling on things. So when, uh, you know, the upper management came to the decision that we're going to kind of move on from the station manager we have now, um, it was kind of just me tying the shoes I already had on. In a way, I was doing most of the work. I just kind of now had the title. And it was kind of enjoyable for me because then I got to kind of put my stamp on it. And once it kind of has your name on it, I don't know, I just kind of took the pride I had and what I was doing to the next level. And um, I try to even make it more organized and I uh, get the ball rolling on even more things. I would say that it certainly has worked in that way too. Because appreciate that. Not that I, I didn't know in the moment what was happening with management, but I noticed a change from last semester to this semester with how, how everything is organized and how it all works. And I think I think it has. I have seen improvements. Thank you. I've only been here that. two semesters, so I can't speak for anything before that, mm -hmm. of course. But uh, So speaking of which, have you been at Marywood your entire college career? How is that? No. So I uh, started at Temple. Um, I did three semesters there, but um, my second semester there, that was spring of 2020. So that was when we got sent home. Um, and I already knew before then I had reservations about staying and finishing my college career at Temple. But then um, coming home to Scranton, Pennsylvania, it was kind of a no-brainer that I was going to finish out here. Um, I was actually a psychology major when I was at Temple. Uh -huh. So um, as much as I really do have interest in psychology, it was not the field I wanted to have a career in. I totally understand that. I started out as a physical therapy major. Okay. And so, then we uh, both just like totally change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what, what helped you make that change into that the comm course? Um, well, I had a, uh, a buddy's brother who I'm also friends with, but he, he, had he was in this department and he kind of his experiences and hearing about that and all the things he would do as a part of his college curriculum and where he was trying to work and where he was going now. I kind of looked at that and I said, well, wow, that's kind of the things I want to do. And that's the things that I find the most interesting um, and really what gets my gears going about um, having a potential career. Was it a difficult shift? Because again, going from like a field of like science and um, psychology, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. science, biology, um, transitioning from that into more creative field. I know that you said this is kind of what you were, like wanted to do from the start. Mm -hmm. So like that transition from... It was extremely different at first. I don't want to call it full um, because I think it's something I, I'm much more naturally inclined to doing than I am like a f psychology fields. Um, but it was just the work is so different. You know, psychology, you're, you're studying for these big tests. You're... Um, Really, it's it's more about learning knowledge and accumulating knowledge, whereas this field is more about learning things without applying them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so writing heavy and it's so hands on heavy that um, it's just a totally different style of using your brain. But like I said, something I'm I think a bit more naturally inclined to. Fair enough. All right, well, okay. Let me oh. Hey. <laughs> Okay, Rubain is here. <laughs> hey, right. that's the first episode I'm late for. That's fine. We had the, the first. We had the, a nice replacement here. I just woke up. Yeah. Rubain okay, is here. Okay, well, my <laughs> alarm. So my alarm went off. I guess my girlfriend turned it off and just went to class. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta have a talk after that. Then. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, but like that. This alarm for was for like eight something, or well nine, or ten. I don't remember. I woke up. I'm like, oh damn, my alarm hasn't gone off for the shoot. It's off. <laughs> and I look at the time. It's 2-7. Uh, it's 12-17. Like, fuck. Nice. 12-17, <laughs> you, you, you made it over here pretty quick. Yeah, actually, that's, all that's, fairness, that's decent yeah. timing, yeah. yeah. Six minutes. <laughs> all right, well. Well, we're in the middle of it, so you got to shake I, the cobwebs off. I was like, off, yo, yeah. I hope it's already going. Yeah. I was like, and then what we talked about having the bozo doll, it's <laughs> yeah, like we, in here. Okay. And I like how we joked about it. I yeah, controlled myself this time. <laughs> Ooh. We had, where'd it go? Okay. We got, yeah, flung somewhere, but. All right, so we're talking about Jake's college experience pretty much. Yes. Okay. Hi. Oh, okay. Hey, hey, good to see you. Um, I guess to jump back <laughs> into it, um, philosophy is a very, or psychology is a very different way to use your brain than it is in this communications major. So I think that switch 
was different because it's kind of taking a total 180. But and another just layer of that was the, my last semester and a half of Temple was online. Mm-hmm. That that's also it was 2020 online schooling, which was very infantile. Whereas um, I kind of just felt what I was getting out of my courses wasn't anywhere near what I wanted or signed up for online. So I think I was when I came to Marywood, I was not only very excited to jump into the new fields, but I was just very excited to be in person again. And like I said, the hands on nature of that only added to that excitement. Yeah, I was a con major during the, co- the the pandemic, and it was like the hands on experience that you need for the comm field is impossible to get when you're on Zoom and working by yourself during every single mm-hmm. project. Um, so I kind of get that too, and you got it from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. Now, so you started in 2019, that was your first year of college. Yes. So you're graduating early then? Yes, I'm a semester early. So how did that work out? Um, so one of the reasons I chose Marywood was I actually previously took credits here during high school. So I took um, about a semester's worth of credits um, over like the last two years of my high school career. Um, so it just was kind of no brainer that when I was looking at transfers and all the transferring credits, all that mess, that I would still be able to graduate early if I came here. And that was something you know, it was that important to me. But I was like, well, I spent all that time and money in high school, so I might as well use it a little bit. And pretty sick that you get to start your life early, too. Absolutely. To go out and do what you want to do. Yeah. it's. But, you know, reverse coin, it's also kind of terrifying. <laughs> um, it's weird being a semester early and having to go through this mindset of being at the end of the tunnel. Uh, kind of, I don't want to say alone, but, like, I'm the only one going through it by myself right now. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, while people are wrapping up their final projects and looking forward to next semester, I'm looking forward to the job market and starting my career and it's um it's a little scary and especially like hearing everybody's tonality down here and i'm just in a totally different mindset and mood yeah yeah, you're preparing for totally different things exactly yeah i totally get that because it was um when i while i was like going to like high school when i was preparing to like uh like put my mindset to okay i'm gonna move away for college at this at this point i hadn't like picked where i'm going but i knew i was moving away for college Uh, because i talked to my assistant principal and he was like just move away for like a year come back and see what happens if you don't like it come back you can always come back um and then i was preparing to move away and everyone else was like yo we'll party we'll do this we'll do that i'm like y'all are going to college to party like they're like and i'm like are you guys at least going far away like like florida that makes sense to party like you're going to you're going to school far away to party all right now we're going to the community college Oh, like, so you guys are really staying in this bubble. So, like, no, I, I, I kind of get this. Like, some people just, like, stay in that bubble. And, like, for us, it's like we're staying in the Marywood bubble. Mm. And you're, you're like, Yo, I got build. I got, I, like, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, like, paying build bills now. Like, <laughs> like while I'm in college, like, yeah, I pay bills. But, like, I know once I get out, I'm going to be paying bills. But, like, yeah. these, are, these are about to become big, like. But speaking of that point of like a bubble, I feel like I'm even in a weirder boat because I don't even consider myself a part of the Marywood bubble because I don't know if it was because I'm a transfer student or it's just my personality. I really only associate with comms kids like the rest of them. Like, no offense, but I just <laughs> and I have a, I'm kidding. I have other friends in other fields, but like I'm not somebody who's like a, a butterfly in that respect. But in the comms department, I feel like. I don't want to call myself a leader, but I'm somebody, I'm a station manager. I'm somebody who people know I'm a point of contact to get to other things. So it's kind of, it's a weird kind of dynamic I feel like I have in terms of a very small bubble. I can understand that, especially because the comm department is its own department that kind of is in its own spot. Yeah. Every other building is kind of used for, for the, multiple there's purposes. There's no architecture, but there's also... The visual arts center is right there, too. In, in Interior right? architecture and, like, normal architecture is in the same building. Other people don't come down here, either. It's yeah. Which is just crazy. us. Because they walk yeah. by the staircase every single day. No, which yeah. we've talked about several times in the podcast. No one ever comes down. <laughs> yeah, no one. Uh, a, a lot of people are like, wait, there's stuff down there? Like, what else is down there? Like, yeah, like, like, the coolest stuff in the, the whole <laughs> yeah. freaking campus. I'm pretty sure it's the right? most expensive building in the Easily. Campus. One of them. Easily. Yeah, Easily. Sure. Like, I mean, I, plus we got the, the million-dollar book robot up there. So. <laughs> I thought it was five. It was something, something yeah. huge. Something well, I, I, I was by a teacher. I was actually told the price of this building. In, probably insane, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's double digits Whew. in the million. Yeah. 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 So it's like, and it's like, it's not even low. It's it's almost half. Yeah. It's, 
So anyway, you talk about the yeah. job market. What's the job no, market yeah. you're looking for right now? Whew. Um, right now is a bit different because I do plan on staying local until my lease ends. Um, I probably something in the news fields. Um, freelance editing is something I definitely plan on just taking on just because I can and it's it's all right money. Um, and then honestly, I'm just really anything in media. I think where I would best be suited in terms of a job would be a maybe like a a company's like advertising firm. I'm kind of I'm good on a team where I could really if you give me a goal and a purpose, mm-hmm. help to work towards that goal and that purpose. Um and I think that's something I want to do right now, mostly just because the that's where I feel like the best money would be. Like I would love to be one of those guys who writes the the best screenplay ever, directs the best, you know, film that wins 10 awards at Sundance or something like that. But I just, it's not really plausible right now until I get my feet wet and get myself established in, you know, kind of just the the life aspect of that. I think so many people had that dream to be, you know, Quentin Tarantino or to be, yeah. you know, um, Tom Cruise Russo, on the screen. Russo or Brothers, like mm-hmm. making Marvel movies. But it's, it's, I guess it's good that you're down to earth and you realize that yeah. it's going to take time for that. And it's not impossible to be there, but you have to take the steps to go. Absolutely. You can't yeah. just move out to L.A. and <laughs> drop everything to do that, you know. Yeah. People do, but exactly people do, and I think that's what if I wanted to right now, I'd have to do because I'm at least the way my creative process works is I need to stare at a project or a thing and just like interrogate it. Like I'm not somebody who could just be like you know walk into drive my car and being like, oh my god, that's the idea, I got it. <laughs> like no, I need to look my creative projects in the face and pull out what I want out of them, and that's a process that takes time, and it's um, a process that I don't think I would have the time to do. Until I'm established. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. Do you have any ideas in mind? Like, so, so you're saying advertising now, but like, what's like the big dream? The big dream. Um, that's tough. It's it's a tough question because ever since I was a little boy, my big dream was to be a pro wrestler. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and I'm not saying I won't ever be a pro wrestler. It's just not a field that I would be successful in at the moment. So it's. It's hard for me to say I have a dream under that because it is kind of always like the if I close my eyes and daydream right now, like that's what I would think about. So I just I my other dreams are to just kind of just express myself creatively and kind of have almost like a a legacy or a reputation of like being this creative person who is trusted, I guess, or like, like if you see my name pop up somewhere, it's like, oh, it's gonna be good. Like Jake did it. Like this is gonna be good. That's good. That's yeah, it. It, it's funny you bring up legacy because yesterday when Sister Mary was here, I asked her what she wants to leave as a legacy. Uh, y'all haven't seen that episode yet. It's coming next week. But um, what we want to ask you is like, when you leave? Because um, have have we talked about you taking over the station? Yeah. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, a little, a little bit. bit. Like, when you leave, what's the legacy you want to leave? Because we know kind of what the legacy the last person left. Um, Just, I guess, communicate, communicatable, whatever the word is, like open. Um, I think just F- easy is just the word. Because I think it is very simple what we do here. It doesn't need to be jumping through hoops to get things done. I wanted it to be as fluid and as, like... And I want it to be as easy to work with as possible. So I think yeah. that's my legacy. It's just like Jake was great. Like it ran well. Everything flowed the way it needed to. And, you know, laying the foundation for the next person to take over and do the same thing or even build upon that and do something different. So Jake the Great. Yeah. No, I'll take Jake that. The great, yeah. Yeah. Jake That'd the be. Wise. The Wise. <laughs> that's right. actually so the name Jacob in like uh, Hebrew means wisdom wise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's perfect. So I know that you said you wanted to be a professional wrestler, mm. but you do already have experience wrestling outside of that. A, a little bit, yeah. It's a, I, I was a backyard wrestler for a, pretty much a good portion of my high school life. Uh, my buddy Nick, he built a wrestling ring in his backyard, and um, he kind of, I was one of the first people he kind of asked to be a part of it. And we only really planned on running like one show just because like it was, oh, let's do a wrestling show and invite all of our friends. But it kind of snowballed into this like, immense storyline and almost like a, a wrestling promotion um, where we ended up running 10 shows and, you know, just doing the dumbest of things to my body. I, uh, been through tables, been through ladders, um, 
chairs have been smashed over my back. Uh, kendo sticks, which are like Japanese bamboo canes. Dude, those are hard. Those are hard. <laughs> oh, that's the worst thing I've ever taken. Is it's just like uh, Nick, Nick and I had a match where um, I hit him with it like. 20 times on his request but then in the next match nick was like oh i gotta get my receipt i gotta get him back for what i just did and he took that and you know i was i protected him when i hit him i would just you know kind of not put everything into it just try to get the noise out of it he took that thing and he all the way behind his back and just came straight down (laughs) and like when i tell you i like my body jumped off the ring it just like (laughs) squirming and i just like i got out of the ring and i'm rolling and i'm just like i couldn't even it was like when people talk about a shooting pain, mm-hmm. I really didn't know what they meant until that. Cause I was like, I could feel it everywhere. I can see you're, you're feeling it right now too. I could, yeah, yeah, still feel like it. Yeah, it was, <laughs> the flashbacks are yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So that's like, that, I, cause I remember watching Nick's like short series about Jackie and Miskill mm-hmm. and they had certain episodes where they would show clips of what you guys were doing. Mm-hmm. And I think it was incredible, especially given the constraints that you had, they was in like a backyard pretty much. And, People were coming and watching you guys perform. Yeah, I mean, it really, like, we could have done the wrestling and had, uh, you know, Nick's brother film these matches. and We could have had, you know, fun doing it. But the real beauty of it is all these people who came to these shows and, like, would, you know, cheer and get into it. And it was, like, there were times where, like, we kind of are proud of ourselves. We would get them real riley and really get them in, mm-hmm. into the matches and stuff. And especially because none of these people are wrestling fans. Yeah. And it kind of it started as oh we're coming to the show because this, these are our friends it's kind of a social event this that but it really got to the point where people were genuinely excited for AGWs and to come to these shows in his backyard and people we didn't know and it just kind of spread to this this thing that we couldn't really control at some points. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I, like growing up, I always watched wrestling, and it was like, oh, that's dope. But then, okay, well, it's gonna sound weird, but what kind of got me like kind of back into wrestling right now is like kind of Logan Paul being in it. But it was like I don't really care about the guy, but like, kind of do. I, I, he's wrestling I, 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 now. I, I'm a big fan. He is. I thought he was boxing. Uh, no, uh, no. So he did boxing. He quit boxing, and then he got signed up with WWE. But like Jeez. one of the funniest matches he had was one of the, the recent ones. He was fighting against Roman Reigns. Yeah. Like he shimmies onto him. Like I guess beats him. Uh, in a way or at least we think Mm -hmm. and then Roman Reigns just goes to his friends that are in the crowd and pulls them into the ring and starts (laughs) beating on them and I'm like I've never seen in wrestling you pulling a fan out and but like what that's dope that's I guess one of the reasons I love wrestling is it's such such an anomaly like it's not there's nothing in the world like professional wrestling and people have their opinions on it whether you know oh it's fake how could you watch that whatever and it's like dude I don't watch wrestling because I think it's real Watch wrestling what? because I have literally no idea what's about to happen on this. Yeah, and it's like so entertaining. And then I don't know where Jake Paul shows up. Yeah, Jake Paul defends uh, um, uh, Logan's friends, and then Logan comes back on. Jake leaves. Logan loses, and it's just like, oh, I did not think that. It's so unpredictable. Like wrestling is just like anyone can come out, and that screen when it like goes bright and the name change is on there, you're like, yo, who just stepped in? It's unpredictable, but when it's great, there's also a story. Like, yeah. like you're kind of laying out there was, oh, Logan Paul, he almost did it. He almost did it. But this this other big bad opponent yeah. was like, oh, you almost beat me. Screw you. I'm going to kick your friend's ass. And then like, oh, oh, my God, his brother, he's coming out to make the save. Like, is he yeah. going to, oh, my God, we got the Pauls. We're like, whatever. And it's kind of that that playing with your emotions of like, oh, yeah. and that's kind of the the real beauty of it is right. when you actually like you kind of turn off your brain for a moment and you just get into it and, and enjoy it. Right, you don't watch like yeah. Hollywood films because you think they're true. You're exactly. just, you're just no, enjoying the process. I'm not watching Back to the Future because I'm <laughs> like, because I'm like, oh, it's true. Like, I'm watching because yeah. it's entertaining. Mm-hmm. And I think it's cool, yeah, there is a sort of storyline, but at the same time, there's a performative aspect where you can improv your own things and if you're gonna entertain the crowd. But it's like, that's the thing, it's like it's like a play, so you get to do the improv and try to entertain, but it's, it's kind of like a sports crowd. So it's not like yeah. you do a improv in a, like a musical and it's like, oh, that was a really witty line. Like you do some good improv and people are like, yes! <laughs> like screaming, and it's like there's a is there's an energy to it too, and that's yeah. what I find most fun. Um, especially it was weird. We were talking about the differences of the school pandemic a little bit. Wrestling in the pandemic was weird because wrestling lost oh, their crowds. Yeah. 
So you had to run these shows and people found different ways of either like piping in fake noise and stuff, whatever, like WWE did this thing they called it the Thunderdome where they literally like almost put a a Tron, like a bunch of monitors of Zoom calls around the ring so it pretended like there was people watching. It was weird. It was weird. But then it was like, just like with getting back to in-person classes, when we got back to in-person wrestling, it was like, oh, (laughs) I missed this. I needed this because it's a totally different energy and feeling. I mean, when we got back to in-person classes, I'm like, I love and hate this. Because, like, I missed kind of, like, going to class, like, in my bed, kind of warm and cozy. But I'm like, I didn't learn anything. Like, my first two years of college, I could easily say I didn't learn much. Yeah. Whereas of now, it's just like I'm learning so much more from these classes. And it's just like, I don't think I would have if I wasn't sitting in them. And there's, like, the group aspect of it, too, where we're doing projects together and we're having discussions in class together. Like a discussion over Zoom, we all yeah. know, is essentially impossible. No, yeah. yeah, no one wants to talk. But over here, like, I uh, like, um, I don't know, like in Dr. Batonis' class, I'll say something, and someone from the back says something, and then Cam might say something, and then the other Jake might say, wait, the other Jake is not in the class. Um, but it's people it's bouncing. Nate might say yeah. something, I might say something. I always get confused between the twins. Which one's this? <laughs> I think judging off that, but we're like bouncing off that. Um, yeah. Another big thing is where the like the learning in this field is done in the field work. Mm-hmm. Like you can sit there and talk about theoretical filmmaking all you want, yeah. but you don't actually learn until you pick up a camera and start shooting things. Yeah. And you start working with people who kind of know what they're doing and learning from them. And you totally lost that aspect online. And no, oh, yeah. That was one of the the beauties of being in person or is one of the beauties of being a person, is you you get no physical interaction and that feedback with another person. I could go to Jason if we're working on a project and be like, oh, how do you think you'd shoot this? And you could show it, and you, you learn something there, and you learn yeah. mm-hmm. new things, and that's when you add things to your toolbox. For me, it was always like, uh, going back to the COVID thing, um, when it started for me, it was just like, oh, this is boring. Like, college is just boring. There's no one to interact with. There's, like, no one in my major that I know. Because, like, I, yeah, we went to classes together. But like, like I had you in, like, Ernie's class. And, like, I went to classes with you. But, like, we didn't really know each other. Because we would go to the class because of the mask. No one would talk to each other. Just leave. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I guess people that were already involved in the major, because I was undecided at the time. I was undecided until the end of the year. because, er, And Ernie was like, Thank God, I wanted you to be a part of this major. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, great. Um, but for a year and a half, I didn't interact with anyone down here or anything. It wasn't until last semester where I just like met Jason one day and I started interacting with, with him in terms of like making projects. And now it's like um, we have Hiller's class, and then we're having Eric as an interview. I'm having you as an interview. Like we're interacting. I feel like that nature of interaction just like went away, and now that it's coming back, it's good. But do you think that it could have gone a bad way? We'll answer that question sure. after the break. So we're taking this little break to give you this advertisement read, uh, which is we want to promote 91.7 VMFM. Is the alternative radio station that's on campus that every student is allowed to uh, attend and they're allowed to be a DJ on it. So if you ever have any inclinations or, or you know, creative outlets you want to do in radio, VMFM is where you want to go. Yeah, and we also take music submissions. We are an alternative radio station, but... Any song that you might want on it, you could give it in and we'll put it in for submission. And after that, you might get it on the radio station. Yeah. So if a song plays, you can be the one to tell all your friends, yeah, I'm the reason this song is yeah. on the radio station right now. Or, hey, I have a radio shift. Maybe you should tune in around like 3 p.m. on Wednesdays and you might be able to hear me on there. And especially uh, you can call in as well when there's a DJ in. There's a number that they give. You can call in and request songs if they're already on the playlist. So if you're listening to the radio and you want a specific song, call in and ask them. Yeah, so make sure to check out 91.7 VMFM. Uh, so I was asking, you know, how, like, things were awkward during the COVID years, and now it's not. Like, we're going back to normal. Do you think, like, a shift in the universe could have happened and we could have ended up where it's just, like, that's the new norm? Now, I think people were so ready for that and craving that. I think we're human beings. Yeah. It, there's there's a, a thing in our brain, not to get a little, like, psychological here, mm-hmm. that makes us want to communicate with each other that makes us want to have that sense of community and that sense of belonging it's why we formed communities in the first place and i think especially when everybody was so we were talking about bubbles in their own little home unit bubble or wherever they were at during covid there was a craving to get back into the the greater social worlds so you think that no matter how it happened, it would have happened that we would have come together once again. Yeah, I mean, if it was something, you know, I guess traumatic, super traumatic. I'm not saying COVID wasn't traumatic for some people, but if it was something 
that I don't know. Like a meteorite hit Earth. Exactly. Half yeah. the population like, yeah. was dead. The way we lived life was drastically <laughs> changed, <laughs> maybe. But like, you know, yeah. we were wearing masks and nothing really else was that different. Yeah. It's become like a, the flu in a sense. It's become the new flu. And I think that's the only way to, it's going to become, or the only way we're going to move forward is it does, it is just the reality of our world now in the same way the flu is. Yeah. And, you know, you have flu season, you're probably going to have COVID season. Mm-hmm. And um, I think as our bodies naturally I guess adapted of all from that the initial virus and strain it's I don't obviously it's a bit more um, there's a bit more harsher side effects and ways that road can go down than the flu or the cold and yeah. other things like that but it's just like I said a reality of our world that we're just gonna have to deal with okay so anyway back to a yeah. little more fun things so you said that you were wrestling during the COVID pandemic did you did you continue it once it ended? Like when you get crowds back in there? Or how did that? Um, so no, I wasn't personally wrestling. That was like just wrestling, oh, wrestling as a whole. General. Okay. Yeah. Um, I stopped wrestling right when I finished high school. Okay. Um, it's just for me, I didn't want to do it without having those ruckus crowds and with everybody going off to college. It just became very different. Um, and also we finished the show. Like I said, it was a story. By the last show we did, we got to put the bow on the story mm-hmm. and finish it off. And that was important to us because um, me and Nick and the other people working on the show, we are very story-driven wrestling fans. So we wanted to make sure that the story we told was was completed. It didn't feel like you were missing something. Yeah. I know that Nick was kind of bringing it back last semester. Is there any chance that you'll write a new story and start? So with know? Nick and I guess with me too, the reason we wouldn't do it again is we both have aspirations to actually do it, not in like a backyard. Because in, in terms of like the wrestling fandom – Backyard is a little taboo. Like, sure, you you can do it and, you know, have fun with it. But if you're somebody who just brags about it and pretends you're a pro wrestler, um, there's actual wrestlers who get trained to do it. You spend about a year training and you work your way up. And it's like yeah. a it's a real grind that it's almost like disrespectful in a way to be like, oh, yeah, I'm a pro wrestler. I put a 12 by 12 boxing ring in my buddy's backyard. Mm. Um, and that's the path Nick is taking is Nick is he's doing the training. He's trying to get booked on real shows where he's actually going to make real money. And um, that was his videos are kind of his outlet of saying, hey, like, I'm here. Like, I'm a very interesting pro wrestler. Pay me to do it. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So do you see yourself doing anything such as that moving on to the more professional side? Once you're, again, so once you're more established and once you've. I, I don't think I out. could um, live my life and not try it mm-hmm. and not like because you, you only get to do this once. And I, I know if I. If I focus on my career until I'm 35, I'll look back and I'll say, why didn't I just try and do the training and yeah. do my best to do it? Even if I fail, at least I could say I tried and failed. That's some great advice. Yeah. If you have a dream, go you, do you, it. Just go for it. Mm-hmm. I, know, I know one thing that like I'm definitely going to take away from your time here, especially as uh, the head of the station, is that when you have like a goal – get a team involved, get other people involved, because then that pushes you to do better. What, like, I was late. Like, I, I know some other people might be like, oh, I'm pissed you guys started without me. But, like, I'm not. I'm happy you guys started without me. It's like the show doesn't stop if I'm not here. Exactly. Get a team, but get a, a team you trust, not just, yeah. you know, heads or bodies. Like, people who, yeah, in your absence, if you actually did oh, yeah. need somebody to take over, or just people who work autonomously, because that's – how you're going to get the best work. You know what I mean? Like they always say, like if you're in the, sp- if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room and no, yeah. it's having people around you who you can bounce things, things off of and ultimately make whatever the product or the goal is better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, like I, I love it. It's like, I come in here, you guys already shoot. Uh, I was running over here. I'm like, I hope they started shooting already. I come in, you guys already shooting. Great. How do I make this funny? Smack the shit out of the ball. But, um, it's like, because I know the previous person, I'm not going to say the name, just because, uh, had talked about Mary Woodstock. Like, that was something that was being talked about for a very long time. Never happened. And then it was like, okay, we're going to do it next year. Never happened. Whereas if you, you were like, all right, we're going to implement this stuff. Implementation happened in two weeks. And I was like, hey, what do you think about this being a part of 91.7? You were like, yeah, cool. Just go talk to these people, see if they sign off on it. Yeah. Uh, and then you were like, yeah, go for it. And like it happened. And that was only because I, f- I feel like this wouldn't have happened if you weren't there and if somebody else was there in that position. I appreciate that. That's what we were talking about before. I like to think that yeah. was I was easy. I um yeah. I was able to help make not only the station better, but students experiences with 
the department yeah. and the station better as well. I think it's understated because we we thank the faculty a lot for yeah. allowing this podcast to happen. But if it weren't you going through you and yeah. you being as benevolent as you are, <laughs> as you mentioned before, yeah. it's like we might not have had the opportunity to, to take this podcast up because unfortunately, you know, we have so many things going on. If it wasn't kind of a practicum, then who knows if we would even do it. No, but now that, now that we're here, now we can continue doing it. it even it's if, rolling. Because like, I'm done with practicum, but I'm going to keep doing this podcast as yeah. long as I can. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's how great it is. So I appreciate it. Is. That. Yeah, of it's like we're putting our money and time and effort into it. And it was like, if we hadn't gotten that, because I know I, like the faculty was like kind of like iffy on it at first, and you were like, no, go for it, do it. And then if it wasn't for you, uh, uh, you like kind of like sticking out for us, I don't think we would have made it. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate the the kudos, but I mean, it was you guys. You guys took the initiative. You 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 came to me with the idea. I wasn't like, hey, I think we need a podcast from ninety one point seven, um, and that was something I tried to, in all kind of the aspects of being the station manager, try to inspire. Like I said, we did um, individualized programming, and that was something I, even when I was the program director before, I really wanted because it's it's students' chance to leave their mark and to actually get their creative gears rolling and add their spin on things. Um, that I think, you know, you guys did that tenfold. And if you leave no other legacy behind, you will at least have Dalos Podcast, podcast as part yeah. of your legacy. Yes. So thank you for being on today, Jake. We appreciate you coming in. Absolutely, uh, guys. I appreciate the time. Yeah. Sorry for being late. I was actually super excited for this episode. I was up actually quite late writing questions down and stuff. No, we and I was like, done. dang it. <laughs> well, it's okay. Maybe we could do a part two when I'm actually in the field and we could, you know, really back in. Retroactively. No, yeah, see. we would love to have you on and like maybe tackle you with like professional life questions. Like, how's life outside the middle? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Like, like I said, this bubble is, it was so close knit and tied together that it's it, like, like I said, I went to Temple. There's reasons why I left Temple. Um, and I came here and I just felt so accepted and welcomed immediately into this little community of crazy, weird people we call the comms department. <laughs> and um, I'm just thankful for my time here. I'm thankful for you guys. But yeah, I guess I have to go to class now. So right. thank you for thank coming you for on. Coming in it's been a pleasure. Guys, have a good one. You guys know the socials. Bye.